I've been here for more than ten hours now. It feels like an eternity. I'm starting to feel the effects of going without food and water for so long. My mouth is so dry, and my head hurts, though it's hard to tell whether that's due to dehydration or the fucking scratching. Is the microphone picking it up? It almost feels like the sound is in my head at this point, grating at my ears, my brain. I wish it would stop. But it won't, will it? Not until it gets me. You know, I've been thinking a lot. Guess I've had a lot of time for that. There's still so much that doesn't add up. Who even is the organist? Did he really disappear? Why? I wish I had all the answers to give you. It would make for a much better story. But I don't yet. And judging by the fact that I'm most likely going to die here, I probably never will. Who knows, though? Maybe I will get out alive. Somehow. And whatever happens, at least you'll have this part of the story. I'm Lindsay Weaver, and hopefully this isn't the last you hear from me. The Organist's Son Episode 3 Strike a Match I would have liked to tell you that my reaction to what I saw before me was rational, thought out, or in any way useful. But honestly, it wasn't. I just stood there, frozen, entirely unable to process what I even saw. There was fire in his hand. It wasn't burning him like it should have been. Where did it even come from? I was transfixed couldn't look away from the flickering of the tiny flame in his hand, watching even as it grew smaller, dying into a thin wisp of smoke that dissipated so quickly it was hard to tell it had been real at all. But I knew what I'd seen, even if I didn't understand it. Something impossible had just happened. Flynn staggered backwards, gripping a hold of the wall at his side for support. His hands, now sans fire, shook, his usually pale face a ghastly white. Even so, he smiled, triumphant. You saw that, right? he muttered, sounding almost out of breath. I continued to stare dumbly at him, and when my voice finally decided to work again, all that came out was, yes. His smile grew, and he spoke again. Finally. I was worried it wouldn't work this time either. The thought of what I'd seen was sinking in now. Magic. It had to be magic. There was no other explanation. I guess it could have been some elaborate scheme somehow, but how or why he would bother with something like that was beyond me. And in me, a feeling started growing. This was new incomprehensible, and the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. You made fire. You fucking made fire in your hand. How? How does it work? C can you do it again? I was rambling, but I couldn't help myself. There was just so much I needed to know. Flynn looked a little taken aback by the barrage of questions. He hadn't let go of the wall, and his voice still trembled slightly when he answered. I can't do it again now. Why not? I asked. It takes a lot. That's the longest I've been able to keep it burning. As for how it works, I don't really know. I can just do it, he said. Okay. You have to tell me everything. I walked toward him, shutting the door behind me. He stood up straight as I approached, facing me with a serious expression that paled as soon as he let go of the wall. I will, 
but can we sit down first? Sure. I followed him as he led the way to the living room, ignoring the cloud of dust that filled the air as he collapsed on the sofa. I sat down at his side and waited a couple of seconds to let him rest, but ultimately I was too excited to stay quiet. Have you always had magic powers? I don't know. I don't think so. I can't really say when I started to be able to use it. It started as tiny things, so small that I dismissed them as imaginary. A flicker of a light bulb here, a drop of rain on a sunny afternoon there, a spark that disappeared in the blink of an eye. As I said, that fire today is the most I've been able to do so far. But how is it possible? I don't know. It has to be something to do with that door. It's not supposed to be here. And, well, I'm not supposed to be able to do that either, am I? I guess. Either way, it's awesome. He frowned. Didn't look me in the eye. You think so? Can I ask you another question? While my curiosity about his situation was by no means sated, there was one question that burned brighter in my mind than any other. It didn't make sense. Not really. I mean, none of it made sense, but I just had to know. Why me? Why did you tell me this? Why me in particular? Hell, why anyone? I don't know if it's just a movie thing, but don't people with superpowers usually keep them a secret? Well, I have kept it a secret a long time. Not really because I don't want people to know. I do. It's just that it's hard to get people to believe in something like this. Let's just say this isn't the first time I've tried to do this. As for why, well... You know how I told you about my dad going through the door? Well, I think something went wrong on the other side. He got stuck, and now he can't return to our world. For the past ten years, I've been trying to figure out a way to get him back. But it hasn't been going well. I can't open the door. It's been locked for years now, and I haven't been able to figure out a way to get it open. Now I'm out of ideas. I think I need help. I mean, I know it's a lot to ask, and you can definitely say no. I know this is scary stuff and all, and it's probably dangerous, so I won't hold it against you if you don't want to do it. But please, Lindsay, will you help me save my father? I wish I could have said I hesitated, that I weighed my options, that I calmly and rationally considered what to do. But you have to understand, I've always wanted something like this. Something outside of the grey mundanity of everyday life. Something exciting and filled with adventure and intrigue. My very own mystery. So how could I say no? How could I possibly say no? The yes tumbled out of my mouth faster than I could think, and I didn't regret it. Even now I'm not sure I can, even when I know what it's brought me. I left Fletcher Street that day with excitement coursing through my veins. The lonely chill of the dark, sleeping street that another day would have hastened my steps did not reach me, for the houses were no longer the same, nor the pavement or the orange glow of the street lamps. Even the moon above seemed different now, because around me the air seemed alive with magic, and I was high on it. It took a good long while for the emotions to dim enough for me to start thinking things through. It was late when I got home, but I didn't even attempt to go to bed. Instead, I sat at my kitchen table, hands curled around a steaming cup of tea. The world still felt a bit of axis, my hands still not quite my own. But I could feel the heat radiating from the cup, and it grounded me enough to think through what had happened. The implications of what the existence of magic meant soared in my mind. Exciting and terrifying prospects of how the laws of nature could be bent or broken. Anything I could imagine, anything at all, 
could be real or could be made so. It took some resolve not to be swept up in a flight of fancy, but I couldn't let myself indulge in that before I focused on the matter at hand. Flynn had asked me to help him. Just the thought of that awakened the jittery excitement in my chest anew. Even though I knew it had been nothing but coincidence, I couldn't help but feel like I had been chosen, like this was the start of some grand adventure, and I, Lindsay Weaver, was the protagonist. But the question was, what was I to do now? I was going to help Lynn Southard, that much was certain. But how? How did I do that? This was the first time in many years I'd thought about the supernatural without immediate dismissal. And now I had to figure out a way to rescue a man trapped in another world. This was a subject I knew nothing of. So, my first course of action had to be to remedy that. It was almost 1 a.m. when I left my apartment again. I had spent some time scouring the internet first, sifting through the soda science and horror stories in an attempt to find something that sounded real. It had left my head spinning and a knot of frustration growing in my chest. There was so much information, so much of which was probably fake, and I had no clue how to decipher which was which. It felt pointless to keep going like that, but I was still far too restless to sleep, so I put my boots back on and went out into the winter night once more. A cold wind blew through the streets that night, tugging at my coat and racking me with bone-deep chill. So I was thankful when I finally saw the light spilling out of the library windows, tiny islands of warmth in the icy sea of night. No one paid particular mind to my arrival, the few bleary-eyed students too stuck in their desperate, last-minute studies to care about anything but the book in front of them and the ticking clock. I stopped for a few seconds, feeling warmth seep back into my body as I surveyed the room. It had seemed to be such a good idea to go here before, but now, scanning the categories for anything pertaining to the supernatural, I realized how ridiculous it was. Of course the university wouldn't bother with something as unscientific as the occult. But I was already here. Might as well at least try. Searching the internal database of the library on one of the decade-old computers, I did find a couple of books that might be relevant. None of them were exactly what I was looking for, but it would have to do. I was going to leave it at that, but at the last second I decided to make one more search for books related to Mr. Southard. I thought perhaps knowing more about the man in question would provide some clues. However, I seemed to be out of luck. No combination of the words organist and Southard produced any relevant results. There were a couple of books written by people named Southard, as well as a biography over an 18th century duke, and many books about famous organ music and the like. But none of them seemed right. It appeared that Mr. Southard was maybe a bit less famous than his son had made out. Thirty pages or so into the first of the books, the exhaustion hit. While everything up until now had felt like a step towards adventure, the tedium of academic prose quickly killed any remnant of adrenaline left in my system. Yawning, I admitted defeat and headed over to the self-checkout, passing by the only other student left, asleep in his chair. I was digging through the pocket of my coat for my library card when I saw it. Among the brightly colored posters on the notice board, one stood out to me. I think it was the simplicity of it that caught my eye. The crisp black and white, as if the stylized raven, or maybe it was a crow, hard to say, was standing in a field of untouched snow. Written above it were the words, Do you want to get closer to the spiritual realm? Contact Isabella the Medium at 62 George Street. Normally, I wouldn't have given something like this a second glance. I'd never really believed in ghosts or spirits or anything like that. But today I had seen actual, real magic with my own two eyes. So this didn't seem like a scam or a ploy to me. Instead, it felt like fate had thrown me exactly what I'd asked for. 
Waking up the next morning felt like hell. My alarm, usually something I didn't feel either way about, seemed to me a horrid mockery of music. An upbeat fuck you that forcibly dragged me from my rest. In the light of day, the events of yesterday seemed distant and nonsensical. For a while I just sat there, alarm still blaring, trying to make sense of everything. After a long shower and some coffee, I was finally awake enough to think straight. Quickly, I realized a couple of things. Firstly, I was going to be late for class, and the assignment I was supposed to do last night still lay unfinished on my desk. I felt a pang of guilt over that. Yes, all of this was exciting, but I could hardly expect work saving people from supernatural occurrences all my life. I really did want to become a journalist, so passing that class felt important. Not that it matters now. Secondly, I had several missed calls. Not only from Georgia, whom I promised to notify when I left Flynn's house and had them promptly forgotten about, but also one from my mother. I had to call both of them back, and then if I hurried, I had time to do my assignment before my afternoon lecture. It still wasn't great to have neglected things so far, but better late than never. I glanced over at the stack of books I had borrowed last night. The poster, with its stylized crow, midnight black against pure white, stood out even better against the brown of my desk and the cloudy sky outside my window. I hesitated for a moment, locked in a battle with myself that I knew I was going to lose. Before I left, I shot a quick message to Georgia to make sure she knew I was still alive. And then... Yesterday's schoolwork still abandoned on the desk, and phone calls still unmade. I left my apartment for the last time. Isabella's practice was hardly very impressive from the outside. The building was getting old, but it wasn't the kind of architecture that had ever been remarkable, even when new. Now the concrete was discolored and worn painted neon pink and green by the light spilling from the sign above the Chinese restaurant that took up most of the bottom floor. It was the side door, almost hidden from view, that was the entrance to Sabella's place. If I'm honest, it didn't look very professional, just a piece of paper with the words, Isabella, medium, in bold black lettering that would have given a better impression if it hadn't been lopsided. I opened my door, and was met with a staircase, sparsely decorated with dream catches and various posters of flowers. It was at the top of these stairs that the shop itself was located. It was a tiny place, only large enough for a counter and three shelves. At a glance, the items on display hardly seemed impressive. It appeared to be the same kitschy knick-knacks sold in any second-rate spiritual store, all overpriced crystals and novelty Buddhas. The air was permeated by the dizzying smell of incense. At the moment, it was empty. I walked up to the counter and rang the small bell that sat atop it. After that, it didn't take long before I heard footsteps approaching, and soon the beaded curtain that obscured the rest of the space from view was parted, and a woman stepped out. I had expected her to be in some way mysterious. Perhaps an ancient old woman wrapped in shawls, or maybe a scowling, unnaturally pale beauty of indeterminable age. But Isabella Rathway did not look anything like that. She was very short, probably in her thirties, with rounded features and wavy blonde hair. If I had to describe her appearance in one word, it would have to be pleasant. Welcome. Can I help you with anything, love? She smiled, wide and toothy. Are you Isabella? I asked. Yes, that's me. Now what can I do for you? I heard that you can contact the spiritual realm. Is that true? Yes, of course. Do you want to know your future? She paused, clearly gating my reaction. Or maybe there's someone on the other side you want to contact. Well, uh, yes. Wonderful, love. Come with me. She turned, parting the beaded curtain and stepping into the back room. It was a small space and quite cluttered. As I sat down opposite Isabel, I couldn't help but feel a bit claustrophobic. Isabel, on the other hand, seemed used to the cramped space, deftly placing and lighting a few candles before speaking again. 
First, what's your relation to the departed? When you say departed, you mean dead, right? Yes, love, I mean dead. Well, what if the person I want to contact isn't dead, exactly? Is that still something you can do? Isabella's brow furrowed. Her cadence had changed when she continued. What do you mean by not exactly dead? I can only contact other realms, so if the person you're looking for is still in this one, I can't help you. Sorry, love. No, he isn't in this world. And what do you mean? Where is he? Isabella leaned in closer, interest gleaming in her grey eyes. The light of the candles cast flickering shadows over her features, making her look almost ethereal, a sister to the flame that twisted and burned on the table, ever moving, ever changing. The smell of incense still covered the room, cloying in its sweetness, hypnotic and repulsive all at once. I swallowed, trying to shake the dizziness that suddenly gripped me. He's... It's hard to explain. He left this world a while back, but not through dying? I came to you because I thought that maybe you could contact him. Can you do that? Isabella was silent for a while. I don't know. Maybe. I would need more information, though. Who is this man? How did he get to another world? The way she said it gave me pause. There was an eagerness in her voice, almost a hunger. And there was part of me that started to wonder whether this had really been a good idea. Isabella was nice and all, but the atmosphere put me in a weird mood. Between the tight space, the candlelight and the incense, I felt boxed in, out of control. How did I know I could trust this woman that I'd just met? How did I know she believed me? How did I know if she was a fraud? I didn't. Perhaps getting her involved was a bad idea. Perhaps I should just walk out right now. But on the other hand, what else was I going to do? This was my only lead, and besides, what was the harm, really? Worst case scenario, she was a fraud and I was back to square one. I would be no worse off than I already was. No, this was worth the risk. So I told her. I told her the entire story about me and Flynn and his father. All the while she sat there, taking it in silently. When I was finally done, she leaned back in her chair, eyes distant. She spoke softly and with great care. That sure is something. I could certainly try to contact Mr. Southard, though I must admit that I don't know if it will work. I have never tried something like this before. It's probably going to be hard. So you believe me? I do, yes. Is there anything I can do to help? Can I make it easier for you somehow? Well, knowledge about the person I have to contact usually helps things along. Age, birthday, likes, dislikes, that sort of thing. Any information at all, really. If possible, I usually conduct the ritual at the place where the person died. That makes the connection stronger. I'm sorry. I don't really know a lot. Just his name and profession. Well, not really his full name, but the last name. Is that going to be enough? Isabella smiled. Well, love, I can certainly try. But without anything more concrete, it's doubtful we'll get results. That wasn't what I wanted to hear. I could, of course, try to research Mr. Southard more thoroughly and come back at a later date. But I could feel the promise of adventure singing in my blood, and waiting didn't feel like an option. So, like an impatient fool, I took the other, somewhat senseless alternative. You said you usually go to the place the person died, right? Yes, but obviously there isn't a place of death in this case, considering no death occurred. Well, there is a place of disappearance. Perhaps going there would be helpful, I said. 
I think it very well might be. When should we schedule this for? I'm all booked up for the next couple of days. Maybe the beginning of next week? I couldn't help but feel disappointed. I've never been good at waiting. And right then a week felt like an eternity. Is there any way we could do it sooner? Maybe today? As long as you're free, of course. Well, I actually don't have any appointments today. We could head over there right now, if that works for you. Yeah, that works just fine, I said. Great. Isabella quickly blew out the candles and stood up, picking up a coat from where it lay draped over one of the unused chairs and guiding me toward the exit. When we had reached the top of the staircase, she stopped for a second. Oh, and by the way, love, I charge extra for visits. That's fine, right? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, I said, and she smiled. And then we exited the building, heading back to Fletcher Street 11. As we left the shop, I felt my phone buzz in my pocket. With a sigh, I pulled it out. Mum was calling again. I... I didn't answer. <laughs> that would have been the last time I talked to her. And I didn't answer. Oh my god. I'm going to die here. Aren't I? I'm going to die in this shitty-ass vent, making this stupid recording, and I will never speak to my mother again. <laughs> Fuck. This is so unfair. I know I should have stayed out of things and whatever, that I didn't make the best decisions. But how could I have known it would end like this? I'll never talk to my mom again. I... <sighs> Sorry. This has been Lindsay Weaver. I think that's enough for now.